Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Irish. I am a performance engineer working on developer tooling for Chrome. And I'm Elizabeth Sweeney. I'm a product manager working on Developer Insights products on the web platform in Chrome. So today, our goal is to make sure that we can all measure, optimize, and monitor our site speed like pros. Yep. That's and great. we're not here to espouse best practices just for the sake of it, right? But we know, you know performance sites are profitable sites. And that's the core of it. So we know it can be difficult to know where to start. And there are a lot of things that can torpedo your ability to make your sites fast. That's right. So we came up with a, um, a blueprint for your mm -hmm. performance success. And before we dive in, let's remind ourselves just how important site speed is. Yeah. I love this. Uh, is my, mm. No, I do not like this. No, this is terrible. But I know of something even worse. Um, yeah. Like, Hello? Like, <laughs> web page, just give me a paint, please. Yeah. Show me something. We know it's bad, but just how bad is this? The impact on user experience is not minimal. The, in fact, the speed that it takes for a page to load is revealed to be the most important factor in a user's mobile experience. It's more important than how easy it is to find what they want. It's more important than the simplicity of using the site. And interestingly enough, it is three times more important than what a site looks like. So the takeaway is performance is critical. Yeah. And we know that's hard to believe, but we actually are that impatient, uh, I promise. When overall page load time goes from one to three seconds, the probability of bounce increases by 32%. And when you go from 1 to 10 seconds, then that 9 second delta increases your chance of bounce by 123%. Wow. So yeah, like Elizabeth said, this isn't just about speed for the sake of speed. Although, like, you know, as developers, it does feel really good to get a, a nice TTI or a nice FCP. Feels good. But that investment that we make as developers on site speed can have direct impacts on business success. That's absolutely right. And we've seen these investments pay off time and time again for our partners. When Pinterest revamped their mobile web experience to focus on performance, they saw an uplift in both user, user sentiment and engagement. And that net effect was a 44% increase in their revenue. Uh, their website is now their top platform for signups. Tinder, after implementing and enforcing an aggressive performance budget, uh, now sees more swipes on the web than they do on their mobile app. So we'll be, <laughs> yes, we'll be talking more about how performance budgets come into the equation a little bit later. But over and over again, we see the exact same pattern. Those who know how to design and implement fast sites get more uh, satisfaction from their users, higher conversion rates, more time spent on pages, and more higher revenue. OK, so all this is great. But it is difficult to know like, where to start and how to prioritize mm -hmm. when you're trying to improve your site speed. So we created this blueprint to set up teams for performance success. So within this blueprint, we have 15 uh, recommended actions for you, starting from the, kind of the very basics, scaling up to what we would consider to be a very mature web performance culture. So let's make sure that we all start on even footing. What are the things that absolutely everybody should feel comfortable about? These are the table stakes for performance. We start with wanting to know the current status of our page. Are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? And you can get this snapshot by using the PageSpeed Insights web app. You can run any URL through the tool, and it'll provide you with both the lab and field data necessary to benchmark your page's speed. And I want to take a minute to break down the elements of what you get back in that report. First, you see the score gauge at the very top of the report. And this is a high level indication of how your page is doing. It's the same score as you'd find in Lighthouse. And the score is calculated with weighted performance metrics that Lighthouse measures, including things like first contentful paint and time to interactive. What's really special about the PSI tool is that it provides you with both lab and field data in one fell swoop. The field data is sourced from the Chrome User Experience Report, or CRUX, which I'll be talking about a little bit more later, and the lab data, including both the performance metrics as well as the opportunities and diagnostics that you see beneath it, those are all powered by Lighthouse. So you get the same results that you would from Lighthouse within the DevTools Audit Panel, for instance, but it's running on our servers instead of your local machine. So action two is 
OK, I saw what PageSpeed Insights told me about and gave me some suggestions. And I want to go try those out, implement those suggestions on my machine. So I'm going to need to kind of like iterate a little bit. Uh, so now it makes sense to kind of go to your local host, your development environment, open up DevTools, and here you open up the audits panel. Uh, so you're faced with something like this, and then you can get off to the races and try it out. Um, and actually, since it's, well, since it's the I.O. talk, we did have some changes, some new stuff. So we actually shipped a brand new version of Lighthouse, version 5.0, today. Um, and there's some new features uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, one of those was mentioned actually yesterday in the keynote. Uh, it's called Lighthouse Stack Packs. Uh, stack Packs are really cool. It's a feature that allows uh, Lighthouse to include specific recommendations based on the stack that you're using. So Lighthouse detects what kind of platform, what software your site is built on. And instead of just surfacing just the generalized recommendation, uh, we add additional messages that are just for you in that platform. Uh, we're working closely with the community to make sure that all the recommendations are coming from experts that know this stuff and make sure that the advice is tailored to the platform. Uh, the first uh, stack back is for WordPress. Uh, that's available today. You'll see that in PageSpeed Insights. Uh, you'll see that in Chrome Canary. Uh, and as new ones are created by community experts, uh, we'll be adding those in. So hold on a minute. Can we go back? Because that looks new. The logo, the report. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, some new stuff. Uh, OK, so uh, I'll get into that. All right, so some of the new stuff. Uh, we got a new kind of refreshed Lighthouse UI. Um, we want to make sure with the report that it's clear and actionable. So we've done a UX and visual refresh just to prioritize the right data. So you'll see this new design on PageSpeed Insights. You'll see it in Chrome Canary next week. Um, it's good stuff. Also, <clears throat> we. OK, we had to kind of like hop on the hype train uh, for one feature. I mean, it, it is arguably the must-have feature of any modern UI in 2019, dark mode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We just had to. Oh, thank you. Oh. Uh, yeah, dark mode. It's good. It's good. It's nice. You can flip it on in the menu in the top right. Uh, and also, we do that cool thing with like if you set the operating system preferences and that media query. and it, you know, had to do it. So, OK, anyways, sorry, you can go back. Uh, yeah, so, go so you're telling me we get stack packs and a new UI with dark mode? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. OK, so that's all great. But on to action three. Um, it's great to get a snapshot of your field data in PSI, but you want to see how your site actually evolves over time. So as we mentioned bef briefly before, the Chrome User Experience Report provides user experience metrics for how real-world Chrome users experience popular destinations on the web. It is a data set that is powered by real users, and the metrics collected are aggregated anonymous anonymously from users who have opted in. As of this past month, the data set coverage has expanded over 5 million origins. And if you don't see field data for an origin yet, just know that it's, it's coming because we're always working to expand our origin coverage. And the Crux dashboard built by this fine gentleman over here, Rick Viscomi, allows you to better understand how an origin's performance evolves. It's built on Data Studio, and it automatically syncs with the latest, latest data sets and can be easily customized and, customized and shared with your team online. So right now, you're seeing FCP being drilled down into, but you can easily go more in depth into other field metrics or things like proportion of device usage and network connection types. All right, action four is we want to quantify the experience that users are having on our site. For this is we're just going to dig into the metrics and understanding what's going on in these definitions of these metrics. Um, loading is, well, actually, comes right from the W3C spec for paint timing. Load is not a single moment in time. It's an experience that no one metric can fully capture. Uh, so there's multiple moments that really contribute to quantifying what that experience is like. Uh, we've talked about some of these metrics previously, uh, things like first content full paint, time to interactive, the first input delay. Uh, these are great metrics and, and really uh, do a good job of capturing, capturing some things. <laughs> But we uh, wanted to introduce you to kind of the new kids on the block. There's a few metrics that are in development, uh, and I wanted to introduce them to you today. So the first one is layout stability. Uh, and to explain this, uh, yeah, best to start with the example. Now, Elizabeth and I, we made this, uh, made this website. <laughs> um, it's a cute cat. It wants to be clicked on. It can seems I, good. Can I click on you it? You certainly can. But 
Um, the other day, I actually had to add some monetization to the site. I don't know why, but I did, and unfortunately, I didn't do it in a nice way. Mm. And so you might try and click on it and put like an ad, and then it shifts it down. And you you know when this mm. happens, it's so annoying. So like it might be ads, but it might just be you know an image. Lots of things can kind of move things around as the page loads, and it's frustrating you know as users when it moves around. Um, layout stability is a metric that's all about quantifying this experience, taking a look at the elements, their dimensions, and their movements, uh, and putting that into a score. Uh, there's a bunch more details, but you can read about, read about them in this explainer here. The second metric that I want to introduce you to is not first contentful paint, but largest. So the largest contentful paint uh, here, well, you know, in this load, we start out blank, just the text, and then finally this image fin finishes downloading, and that's good. Usually if it's like the big image, we call it the hero image, the hero content, right? Uh, and so in this case, we're interested in this moment in time when the big content is done. Now, this content may be uh, an image. It may be text. Um, and there's a few things to figure out there. So in the explainer for this one, you can see a little bit some of the details there. So there's a big section on what is largest. How do we quantify that? Uh, figuring out what contentful means, figuring out paint. So for instance, figuring out the details with uh, foreground images versus background images with text, handling web fonts, things like that. Mm -hmm. So the details are in there. You can, you can dig into that. Again, these are metrics that are still in development, uh, but you'll be seeing more, be more about these soon. All right. Wow. OK. Uh, so before we go any further, we want to take a brief respite and examine a, <clears throat> a taxonomy of speed tooling. Mm. <laughs> Yes, yes, nice. Um, so we're going to cover a few talks, a few tools during this talk. Um, and all these tools make sense uh, for different situations. But one thing I just want to make clear is that they're all based on the same core engine and using the same data sources. So in particular, most lab, uh, most lab tools are powered by Lighthouse um, at the base, whereas WebPerf APIs and Chrome usage statistics are what powers pretty much all field data, uh, RUM solutions, things like that. All right. So that captures kind of the performance basics. Let's move on to the good stuff, some of the more intermediate items. So we're getting into the third, sorry, the, the second of three blueprints, mm -hmm. the plumbing. Uh, these are professional performance techniques. Um, and actually, for step five, I'd like to uh, introduce hold, Amir. Hold, hold on. Uh, you skipped a step. Uh, step Sorry, five. Amir. We just did four. No, there's an, there's one in between. There's a. Yeah, it's four and three quarters, oh. and it's one of the most important. Four and three quarters, ones. obvious. Uh, what was yeah, four and three you quarters? can't skip that one. Oh, okay, my So bad. if you don't have buy-in from all of your stakeholders that speed is important and that it's not just your best friend but it's everybody's best friend, everything else in the blueprint kind of becomes a moot point. Uh, and people get excited about the shiniest new feature, and performance gets put on the back burner. We've all been there. So this means that you want to make sure that you have support from all ports of parts of your organization to execute against the performance that, uh, blueprint that we're sharing with you today. There's nothing more painful than having to layer performance on top of a fundamentally non-performant site. That's just it's, it's painful. But this can be seen in how organizations often design their web apps. Performance is an afterthought. And often, it only becomes a priority in the heat of an emergency. So users are complaining, businesses are losing money, and then panic ensues. But like we said earlier, performance at the end of the day is about solving business problems. And understanding that the conversations we need to increase conversions and we need to lower our FCP are effectively the same conversation is a really good way to get both business and engineering stakeholders excited about solving problems that lend themselves towards increasing quality for your users. OK, now you can introduce Amir. Oh, great. All right, everyone, uh, please welcome Amir Rahum. Engineer on the Google Search Console. Well, thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir. And for those of you who don't know, Search Console is a tool that gives you insight into how your website is performing on Google Search, what queries bring users to your site, how many users see your website in the search results, how many click through, and so on. It also provides reports on your website's coverage on the Google Search Index as well as help you fix any issues you might have relating to search features, like AMP or structured data. But getting users to your site is not enough. 
like you've just heard, faster means more convergence. So with Search Console, we want to help website owners provide users with an amazing experience that loads fast and keeps the bounce rate slow. That's why I'm happy to announce that we've been working on a new speed report for Search Console. It's still in beta, but today we'll take a sneak peek at the new report. Now, this report is pivoted around field metrics. So that's first contentful paint and first input delay based on the Chrome user experience report data. And the goal here is to get an overview of how all the pages in your website are doing based on real user measurements, then zooming in on a particular metric and device that's problematic, and getting, example pages for mis getting examples for misbehaving pages. And then taking those examples, fixing them, iterating on them with developer tools like Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights. So let's take a look. So what you see here is the breakdown for the Google developer website based on actual user measurements aggregated over the last 28 days. And the first thing you see here is that we classify all the URLs into three buckets, slow, average, and fast. So right off the top, you can get an overview of how your site is doing on a per URL basis. So for developer site, we have about 4,000 slow URLs, about 33,000 average pages, and 800 fast pages. And we classify you a page as slow if it's considered slow on any metric on either desktop or mobile. So if you have a page that has a slow first input delay, for example, on mobile, it will count towards a slow bucket, even if the other metrics are doing well. So that's kind of a strict definition. Fast URLs are fast on all metrics across all devices. So that's a really good place to be. And the, re the rest of your pages are labeled average. And that's usually uh, the biggest bucket, as you can see here. Now, under the summary count, you can see an overtime graph of these performance buckets. So you can get a feel of the trend of, your, uh, the trend of your speed performance over the last three months. This is where you'll see the effects of any performance fixes you implement as they reach actual users. So now that you know how your website is doing, we can drill down to a specific issue. And because we know it's unrealistic to fix an entire website in one go, we really wanted to help website owners figure out where to spend the resources when fixing speed issues. So with the speed report, we're also introducing page grouping. Instead of just a list of URLs, we take all the pages in your site and group them with pages that have a similar experience and that we think will have the same underlying technical issues. This way, if your issue is caused by a common template or a slow resource, you can fix them all at once. You can see that each URL here actually represents a bunch of similar URLs, and we aggregate the performance metric for the entire group. So in this example, for the first page group, it has about uh, 1,000 URLs and an aggregated first content for paint value of 3.2 seconds. And if you click on one of the rows, you can see more examples of pages in that group. This allows you to focus on the pages you care about the most. And for a developer site, we have, for example, a page group for all the pages describing structured data items you can implement on your site. And all of these pages, they have a similar structure. And it's very likely that the technical issues will be the, similar, will be the same or similar on all of these. So you can fix them all in one go. And after you decide on what to fix, it's time to take the examples here back to developer tools like PageSpeed Insights. And you can see there's like a direct link to PageSpeed Insights in the panel for the URL you selected. And iterate on a fix using lab data. And when you're done, you can come back, come back to Search Console and see the effects of your fix on your see the effects of your fix on your website as a whole. And that's it. So as I've said, this report is still being beta tested. Uh, but, you can, but you can help. You can, sign up, you can sign up to register in, for the beta in this link. And we'll be adding more participants over the next few weeks. And as always, we appreciate any feedback you have. And if you've never used Search Console or have any questions, be sure to visit us in the sandbox area to get a demo of Search Console in action. And with that, I'll bring it back to Elizabeth and Paul. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amir. So we are so excited by the speed report and new features like being able to dissect the crux data by page groupings. Like, that's super cool. That's rad. Uh, and what's great is that by step six, we are comfortable with what we want to be measuring. We know what speed me metrics we want to be tracking, both in the lab and in the field, and what tools we want to use to do so. But we still haven't defined success. So my TTI is seven seconds. Am I happy about this? I don't really know, because we haven't set our goals yet. So it's time to define a performance budget. 
And you are in control and able to define what budget feels reasonable for your team. However, setting reasonably aggressive goals will allow you to maintain optimal performance when new features are introduced, as the team changes, and when day-to-day -day priorities devour your bandwidth, which we know happens all the time. So there are three kinds of budgets that you can set, including resource quantity, like the weight of your JavaScript or the number of network requests, milestone or metric budgets, like a maximum threshold for your interactivity or load metrics, or score budgets based on Lighthouse. And just for the record, if you set a score budget that is 100 for all of your audit categories, I bow to you and more power to you. Just know that there's an awesome Easter egg in there somewhere, but you didn't hear it from me. Hey, not the, don't tell them about the fireworks. I made him say it. <laughs> <laughs> they look cool. All right, all right. So just an hour ago during the Speed at Scale talk, Katie and Addy went into depth about incorporating performance budgets into your workflow. And we're so excited to have Lighthouse's new performance budgeting feature, LightWallet, announced this I.O. Lighthouse now supports your resource quantity budgets within the report UI itself so that you and your team can evaluate how well your site is performing against the goals that you've set. To get started, you define a budget file. This example sets a budget of 125 kilobytes for all scripts, 50 for all style sheets, and 35 network requests total. Then you use your budget in Lighthouse by passing the budget path flag followed by the path to your budget file in order to calculate whenever a category is over budget. And if you're not sure where to start, you can check out Katie's performance budget calculator to give you a good sense of what a good default budget is for you and your team based on your goals. All right, action seven. Uh, you want to diagnose specific aspects of what in particular is affecting page load. And I think I remember this is the DevTools performance panel. <laughs> yeah, my buddy. Ah, I like performance panel. There's some good stuff. I mean, in the performance panel, we're all about getting into the details. And really, in order to show kind of what this is about. Y you should do a demo. Do, do I have to? Yeah. OK, I'll do a demo. <laughs> all right. Um, cool. So what we're going to look at is uh, the Wikipedia page for cat. Great little page. And I want to understand uh, how it loads. Um, so what we're going to do is first I'm just going to start it off from about blank and hit record. This is a non-throttled run, by the way, uh, but we'll just keep it easy. All right, I navigate, I hit stop. Um, that seems good. All right, so a lot of things going on here, right? We got all this stuff down here. But really, um, I'm just interested in when we get that content on the top of the screen. So I'm just going to kind of scrub in the top and see, OK, yeah, well, the Looks like the icons on the top and the logo were a little late to come in, but we had the content pretty early. So I'll just select that area. Oh, wow. OK. In this case, like none of that stuff on the main thread was even there. Um, so what we have is we have this network track and then the main thread. One thing that kind of I notice is uh, this little gap uh, in the middle. And what happens is we have the HTML downloading over here. And then our endpoint is actually here. It's that first paint, first contentful paint, first meaningful paint, all on the exact same point in time. And in fact, we can open up frames just to see exactly what the screen looked like at that point. All right. Uh, so why did we have this gap here on the main thread? Well, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. So we finish the HTML download, right? And we're parsing the HTML here. We parse it again over here, but here, Main thread's not doing really anything. Um, looks like we're downloading some images, uh, downloading a script, but the priority is low. So that means it's not render blocking. So that shouldn't be a problem. But the purple is style sheet, priority of highest. And highest indicates that it's render blocking. Um, and so what happened is we download the HTML, but then we find the render blocking style sheet. So we got to go fetch that. Then we f once that finishes, then you see we come down here, and we finish parsing the rest of the HTML. We recalculate style, layout, paint, and then pretty soon we finish it off. So this is kind of cool. And in fact, it's interesting because Wikipedia has one of the best web performance teams that there is. Um, 
But still, like, even they have an opportunity. They could take the styles that are in the style sheet, kind of critical CSS thing, and take them and inline them in the HTML, would win them, you know, in this case, something around 30 milliseconds uh, is on my unthrottled run. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, that's probably where I'd start. And then afterwards, I'd start to get into what is happening in the main thread over here, because it looks like there might be some opportunities for improvement. So that's what we can do with the DevTools Perf panel. Uh, back to our slides, I guess. And as much as we'd all like to, we can't sit our entire lives in front of DevTools rerunning Lighthouse over and over again, as ideal as a scenario as that sounds. Yeah. So we're at the point where we need to automate as much of our performance story as possible. And that's where production monitoring comes in. There are a lot of third-party production monitoring solutions that are built on top of Lighthouse's engine. As Paul mentioned earlier, a lot of the web performance tools that you see are based on the same core technologies and data. And I really like that production monitoring can be done with web.dev's measure tool and the API that it runs on, PageSpeed Insights v5 API. With web.dev, you're able to run Lighthouse and track your page's performance over time, as well as other audit categories like accessibility and search engine optimization. When you run Lighthouse within web.dev, you can easily find the guidance that you need to optimize your site's performance. That's one of the joys of it, is that it marries documentation with tooling. So stay tuned for more feature build-outs there. If you plan on using the PSI API in an automated way with regularly scheduled queries, you can get an API key at the URL here. And it's a great way to scale your monitoring over multiple pages or origins. And by default, the API runs just the performance category and on desktop. But you can adjust it for mobile and expand it to include the other Lighthouse categories as well. And you can get crux data from the API too. So if you're looking to build out your own production monitoring solution, this is a really great place to start. So at this point, we need some more details on the user behavior that's on the site. And there's a lot of great solutions for this, but I wanted to call out one in particular. Uh, it was launched uh, just yesterday. Uh, and that is the new web performance monitoring solution from Firebase. Uh, there's some really good stuff in there. And since uh, there weren't so many details yesterday, I want to show a little bit of uh, what it looks like in the real experience. So this is what you'll see in kind of the, the dashboard that welcomes you. Uh, we see a bunch of key performance metrics and the full distribution of those measurements from all of your users. And that's really nice, because in other tools like <clears throat> Google Analytics, you only get like that one average number. And it's not, it's not very indicative of what is happening to all of your users. So it's great to get the full picture here. Uh, you also see uh, metrics like first content full paint, and first input delay in there, too. Um, and then you can also dig into some of these metrics, look at one in particular one, see how they change over time, and then pivot the data based on a few different variables. It's cool. That is really cool. But now you know how to and where to collect field and lab data in aggregate and on a page level, and how to compare how you've performed over time against your benchmarks. But how are you doing in relationship to your competition? Here, we recommend that you leverage the full power of Crux with BigQuery to dig really deeply into the data sets. Not only can you compare one competitor's metrics, but you can compare all competitors across the board within an industry to see where you fall. And you can visit the Crux GitHub repo to discover useful recipes for extracting insights. And also, if you have a recipe that you like, submit a PR and, and share it with everybody. So you have your foundation, and now you have your plumbing. But there's something missing. I can take a shower, but I can't turn on the lights. Shower in the dark, <clears throat> obviously. Got to do that. OK, so now for the stuff that can really light up your world. OK, I can't help myself. Um, so this part of the blueprint for performance success is one of the most valuable things that you can do. Being able to correlate the speed with which your users interact with your site and your conversion, bounce, and engagement rates is a gold mine of insight. There are a few steps to get started with this. Drawing this graph is the first one. Mm -hmm. But step one, actually, is to choose representative pages that you can track and compare over time. Uh, and this is between both your business and your performance metrics. With this in place, then you can reasonably evaluate the correlations of your top performance and business metrics to one another over time. 
This will eventually allow you to estimate the impact of a new feature prior to de deployment, and this is on your revenue, and qu quote the cost of a feature implementation during design. So by now at this point, you've surely noticed that the third parties on your site are bringing you some performance pain. Uh, so we need to sort that out. Uh, there's a few tools here I wanted to shout out. Uh, Request Map uh, gives you a nice view of your third party situation, their network costs, their dependencies. Um, and if you're interested in the web scale impact of third parties, check out Third Party Web. Uh, this was actually built by one of the core Lighthouse engineers, Patrick Hulse, uh, and it summarizes the uh, runtime cost, uh, the JavaScript cost of third parties across the web. Uh, it's really helpful for just like comparing different competitors in a space based on what sort of impact they're going to have to your web page's performance. Uh, and it's also cool because the data behind it is all completely open source. Um, in addition, uh, ultimately solving your third party situation requires working as a team. So one recommendation is bringing together representatives from different parts of the company and kind of establishing uh, a shared goal. We are going to make faster web pages. At that point, you can then review you know, all the third party tags together, understand what their perf impact is, and evaluate you know, what's absolutely required and, and what we can do about things. Right. Action 13, um, your site, you may feel, is not like other sites. And you might want to define performance success that is completely custom to you. For example, on, um, on me and Elizabeth's uh, cat site, well, what is success? Uh, time to first cat. Time to first cat, yeah. Uh, we want this kitty cat in front of the user as soon as possible, so let's create a custom metric for that. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, this is a new API, uh, just kind of on the way out. But you can put on an element timing attribute on the image tag. Uh, and then you'll set up a performance observer, uh, which down at the last line, you observe uh, element entry types. Uh, and then inside the callback, you get data. And you get a timestamp that represents not when that image was finished downloading, but when it was rendered to the screen. Um, when that difference can be significant and important. So now we have, yeah, our time to first cat. Pretty cool. Uh, element, element timing is currently in an origin trial. So this is kind of cool. You just go. It looks kind of scary, but uh, it's, it's really straightforward. Sign up the form, say which origins you want to use it on, and uh, you put in like a header or a meta tag, and you're good to go. All right. And with a custom perf metric, you know what you want to measure. That's awesome. Time to first cat. Fantastic. But we're on action 14. And this is a mere one step away from being like performance pros. So we need to automate the measurement of your custom KPIs. And in Lighthouse, we just kind of taking a step back and taking stock of this, yeah. we really try to make sure that the audits we incorporate into the core report itself are universally actionable and impactful for all developers, regardless of their tech stack, what browser they're in, or their industry. So we know there are valuable audits, though, that are entirely valid for use cases that don't necessarily meet the criteria for universal applicability. And we want to leverage the power of Lighthouse to, as a platform to measure what you care most about. And that's why I'm happy to announce for the first time Lighthouse Plugins. It's a brand new feature that allows domain experts like yourselves to extend the functionality of Lighthouse for your specific needs. At its core, a Lighthouse plugin is a node module that implements a set of checks that will be run by Lighthouse and added to the report as a new category. The Google AdSpeed team created Lighthouse's first plugin, which is already available for CLI users. And this plugin seeks to provide ad managers with detailed, actionable recommendations to improve ads loading on their web pages. Soon, we will be supporting selecting which plugins you want to run via our UI itself so that you can easily share the functionality that you've built with other Lighthouse users. To learn more about Lighthouse plugins, check out our plugin handbook in the Lighthouse GitHub repo. And OK, I'm excited. Yeah. We're almost there. And we're, what's the last action to becoming a master of performance? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked. So when you're developing, at least when I'm developing, I want to know for each and every pull request if 
that's going to impact my TTI, if that's going to make things two seconds slower or two seconds faster, I want to know that before the pull request is merged into master and then deployed out live, right? So implementing performance measurement in continuous integration is one of the most robust methods that you can employ to defend against regressions. Uh, in fact, the fantastic web performance team at Wikipedia recently blogged about their success using a combination of both RUM data and lab performance tooling in CI. Uh, here they were seeing their first paint numbers uh, rising in their RUM data, and they didn't have a good explanation for it. But they have a really robust CI setup, and they were able to see what was actually happening. In fact, as users were switching over to Chrome 69, the numbers went up quite a bit. Uh, they investigated this uh, and filed some bugs with Chromium team. And we also were like, yeah, we also noticed this too. And there was a change in how things were measured. Um, but this gave a lot more confidence as far as what is happening in the performance so that they know, in this case, they weren't at fault. It was a change on our side. Um, we're excited. We want to make sure that you have the confidence to know how each and every change that you make impacts your web performance. So we're working on a new project. It's called Lighthouse CI. Um, and Lighthouse CI is going to be really cool. But it is early. It's all open source, though. It's on GitHub. You can look it up. The curious people can certainly take a look. Um, and uh, we're excited about making sure that you have some of this more control and data to understand how things move. And you're telling me now that I can get Lighthouse pre-prod and post. Yep. That's, that's cool. That's good. All right. So that takes care of the last blueprint. So all right. So I'm going to recommend the next few slides are phones out slides. Oh, yeah. That's if good you stuff. would like to get summaries of oh, stuff. Yeah, it's the full summary. Yeah, that's nice. I can do better than that one. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. I can give you the tools. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. I'd I, I totally photo snapped that. <laughs> so we know it's hard to know which tools to use when and for what purpose. But as Paul said earlier, you know most of them are built on the same foundation. So each one brings its own value proposition. But remember, you're kind of all building off the same same thing. So this toolbox can be seen as everything you need in order to implement your blueprint for performance success. We really want to have your step your back every step of the way. But do know, unfortunately, for uh, step four and a half. Oh, four and a half. Can we go back a second? Yeah, because you are going to have to bring your own whiskey. Oh, bring, but uh, can I just get some whiskey? You can help me out with May, the, Maybe. That would be great. Maybe. Would love it. All right. Here are all of the links that we shared over the course of the entire presentation, just curated for ease of reference. Good stuff. And uh, that's it. Thank you.